one and all for joining in today. Uh, we are looking at a topic uh, that Jesus is spirituality. Now, uh, I'm not very sure if it is grammatically titled correctly because uh, there had been discussion about it. Uh, but nonetheless, I hope you would find uh, this session useful as you try and contrast your own spiritual lives in the light of our leader, our Lord, and our Savior Jesus himself. And we will also, like as usual, have a time of interaction. So please do ask me questions, not about grammar, but anything about what I have shared. I'll be very happy to engage with you. But what I really want to share with you is spirituality that we find in Jesus. And I want to suggest that it's very, not just remarkable, unusual. It beats our expectation. That's the kind of angle I want to share with you. And the prayer is, as we have in the theme verse, that we will follow the example the Lord set for us. So would you please pray with me one more time as we get a little deeper into this theme at hand. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this lovely opportunity. I want to thank you for every brother, sister present here and perhaps any seeker present here. I pray, Lord, that this will be a useful time of understanding you better. So would God, the Holy Spirit, continue to teach us, inspire our hearts and minds, Lord, that in some way, O oh Father, uh, we would be able to take one step closer to you this evening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The theme verse for us in this season, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you, said Jesus. I have set for you an example, which means no excuses. The Lord has given us an example. As you very well know, if you've been part of this program, uh, that this is in the context of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And then he told them, here, I have set an example for you. You should do as I have done for you. But right at that very instance, as Brother Elty would say, imagine in the washing of the feet, if Jesus would have then told his disciples, okay, guys, I have set you an example. Now who's going to wash my feet? I'm sure they would have all jumped upon each other to kind of go and grasp the master's feet. But interestingly, Jesus said, wash one another's feet. And then you can almost imagine the discomfort as Peter might have looked at his fellow disciples or James might have looked at somebody else and, oh my goodness, this guy. Uh, you know what I mean? So Jesus' spirituality actually subverts our understanding of spirituality. And why I personally find this fascinating is I was born and raised in a Christian home. But yet, I find that when I read the Gospels, time and again, uh, Jesus' words or his actions, his gestures, beat my understanding. That's not a spiritual person or a spiritual behavior that I'm expecting. He does something that really catches your attention. So that's why I find this topic very interesting. And I hope in some way you would also find that useful. Now, when we use the word spirituality, it's very complex. In fact, the dictionary does not give a very clear definition on this word. I checked a few dictionaries. Uh, what they seem to suggest is this, the quality that involves deep feelings and beliefs of a religious nature rather than physical parts of life. The quality that involves deep feelings and beliefs of a religious nature rather than physical parts of life. So I'll be giving you the PowerPoint after the session so that you can listen to me quite freely right now. Uh, so generally the definitions go this way, spiritual over against physical or material. That's the distinction. Okay, that's the spiritual part of your life, maybe your religious side of your life, and here is your physical side of your life. But right there, biblical spirituality subverts that understanding. Because in the spirituality the Bible recommends, it includes all of life. The mind, the heart, the behavior, it, it is all encompassing. So it includes everything. So it's not just the material or the physical part, it includes everything. So that's the kind of angle that I'm going to. Another dictionary, another meaning went this way, which I thought was slightly more holistic. Traditionally, spirituality referred to a religious process of reformation, which aims to recover the original shape of man, woman included, oriented at the image of God. To recover the original shape of man, the whole person, the whole being, the fact that we are spiritual beings. Yes, we have a physical component, but we are spiritual beings. So that is a little more 
uh, comprehensive or so it, so it seems for us. Now, please remember the theme verses. Jesus, in a particular context, gave us an example. Okay? So God with us. The life of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, served as a living pattern. Served as a living pattern to shape his disciples so that his astonished enemies observed that these unlettered ordinary men, the disciples of Jesus, who stood so boldly before them, had been with Jesus. No textbook gave these men such courage. They had carefully observed their master's life. And now, by the power of his indwelling spirit, they imitated him. The real difference that seemed to have happened to these 12 disciples and more is the fact that they were able to see the example laid before them by their master as the Holy Spirit brought to remembrance all that Jesus said and did, eventually also changing them from the inside. So Peter would say, we have inherited the divine nature in us. It's really about Jesus modeling it for them, that these people, unschooled disciples, some of them, were able to pick up the message of the master. So the example of Jesus is very clear. If somebody in the group is saying, I've not been having a very exciting, quiet time, devotion time with the Lord, may I suggest go back to the Gospels. Just read the pages of the Gospels. There is so much of color. There's so much of context. There's so much of nuance that is there and life and animation that is there in the Gospels. Even if you are from a Christian background, familiar with the Gospels, you might still find something that's surprising as you continue to meditate on the example that the Lord has set before his disciples and with, before you and I. Now, a famous uh, uh, professor at Stanford University, Dr. Albert Bandura, he made this statement about modeling, about the example that Jesus laid before them. The greatest cause of unconscious learning is modeling. The greatest cause of unconscious learning is modeling. Of course, we may have heard this uh, phrase, uh, especially if you're on the teaching line, it's not all, all things are not taught. Some are just caught. The difference being taught and, and being caught. Okay, modeling or the example. So for that, we need to spend more time in the Gospels to really pick up the example of Jesus. Now, Paul understood the message of Jesus well. In Philippians 4, 9, he says this. He says this elsewhere also about imitating Christ. Philippians 4, 9, he says, to, his, to the church at Philippi, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. See, it's about an example. What you have learned, received, heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace be with you all. Jesus made disciples by his life. One does not teach faith and love with words alone. That's a limitation of a message or a sermon. Disciples' hearts cannot be set on fire by theories. Fire kindles fire, iron sharpens iron, faith calls forth faith, life begets life. So we are called into that life-giving experience with God himself and with his word to kind of be refreshed, to pick up uh, the example that Jesus left before us. Talking about following Jesus closely. The kind of life that Jesus modeled for his disciples. Uh, some of these aspects would include prayer. Jesus not only taught them how to pray. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Somebody asked them, teach us how to pray, and he gave them the Lord's Prayer. But friends, right at, in the Lord's Prayer, there's so much for us to appreciate because that's not the prayer that you and I might have. For example, if Jesus would have turned to the disciples there and said, okay, let me listen to two or three prayers that you would recommend. I'm not expecting any of them would have come close to what Jesus himself taught them. To begin by praying, our Father. Okay, what, what, a, what a profound theology there. Our Father, your Father and mine, our Father. And then the next line, it says, your will be done. Friends, that subverts common understanding of spirituality of prayer. Because mostly when people think about prayer, it's about my needs, my goals, my necessities, my anxieties, my appraisals. It's all about my needs and using prayer, that mechanism to somehow draw some divine energy or favor 
oh, that's not biblical spirituality. Biblical spirituality is not about my will be done. It's the exact opposite. Thy will be done. Now tell me, do you want to pray? I'm sure most of you, if not all of you would say yes. We still learn to say, Lord, your will be done. In other words, as John the Baptist would say, I must decrease and he must increase. So prayer. So Jesus not only taught them prayer, he modeled the prayer for them. How? For example, in Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 35, we read, very early in the morning while it was still dark, everybody is asleep, Jesus got up, he didn't pray right by the bedside, he went to a solitary place and began to pray. So Peter, James and John and others wake up a little later and then they're looking for the master. Why? People are thronging at the door wanting Jesus. And then so these disciples now go looking for the master and they find him praying. Imagine that impact would have had on these people who saw him praying early in the morning alone. Jesus had set an example on prayer. So they've seen the master pray. And then what happens? Much later we find in uh, John's gospel, chapter 17, Jesus makes that high priestly prayer. Or the garden of Gethsemane. He calls these disciples, the, the three of them, Peter, James and John. And he says, come pray with me. And these guys, the eyes are heavy with sleep. They cannot get knocked off. Jesus comes back and says, can you not pray with me for one hour? And then he goes and prays. And his sweat was like blood. The intensity of the agony of that prayer. But well, these disciples had seen that prayer. Jesus not only taught them, he lived out. So people did not have any confusion about what prayer was according to Jesus. So that's the beauty of an example. Not just words, but Jesus practiced prayer in his own life. And the disciples watched that in a close context. And of course, there are many more prayers in the Gospels. You may want to do your own search finding that. Secondly, we find Jesus modeled his reliance on Old Testament scripture. In other words, it pointed his disciples to the fact as much as Jesus was the second person of the Trinity, the Messiah, his dependence, how he treated scripture. Philip Yancey wrote a book called The Bible That Jesus Read. Of course, that's the Old Testament. Yeah. So, but then it's beautiful. Jesus gives so much importance to scripture. I will give you some references in the PowerPoint that you will receive later. But we find that Jesus constantly alluded authority to scripture. Today in the Christian world, for us, for all matters of faith and context, uh, faith, uh, faith and conduct, the Bible is the sole authority. Not a religious leader, but the Bible, not tradition. Not even reason, but the Bible, authority. But we see that in Jesus. Time and again, he kind of gives scripture that authority. Why? This is God's word, the infallible word of God. So Jesus not only talked about the word or preached in the synagogues, but the way he treated it, people have watched it. As a 12-year-old boy, Jesus went and he spent time looking into the script scriptures and reasoning with the scribes in the temple at Jerusalem. He took scripture seriously. Remember the conversation that Jesus had with uh, uh, Satan after, after his fasting and prayer for 40 days? Jesus said, it is written. It is also written. Meaning, if it is written, that's what it is. That's where the authority comes from. Okay, The divine authority of scripture. Elsewhere, Jesus talked about the indestructibility of scripture. Not even a stroke shall go away from the scripture, said Jesus. He said scripture is not broken, will not be broken, that it's infallible. He talked about the supremacy of scripture. He talked about the factual accuracy. For example, he co quoted Old Testament people like Jonah and Noah, which tells us that Jesus treated them as historical figures. So he's treating part of the Old Testament as his, it's historical here. So that's the kind of uh, example that we see in Jesus, the way he, uh, he upheld the, the, the reading of the scripture. And friends, Jesus not only did that, he told his disciples, also applies to us, 
man or woman shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god in other words if you are thinking about spirituality if you are thinking of yourself as a believer in the lord we need a daily sustenance on god's word we can exist without reading the bible without reading god's word without meditating on god's word but to live as a christian man or woman needs god's word so every time you think about physical nourishment make sure that your spiritual side is also nourished by god's word especially when you say grace before a meal it's a good time to cross check and see have i also am i also spiritually fed by god's word or not elsewhere jesus also said my sheep hear my voice simple my sheep hear my voice so the question is are we trained are we his sheep are we trained are we picking up the signals and messages the lord is sending our way so jesus taught about what should be our attitude to scripture but he also modeled it for us so we are privileged to have that example in our own lives so prayer and bible reading now those are two important spiritual disciplines why prayer is when we express to god sometimes by the help of god the holy spirit who gives us the sighs and moans and sometimes we pray not knowing how to say but something in us kind of seems to utter something so we pray it's our expression to god bible reading or devotion is when god through his word speaks to us two way communication very crucial for a believer in the lord jesus christ not just that Jesus not only uh, taught, taught about prayer, he not only taught about uh, dependence on God's word, his evangelism, the way he reached out to people. He constantly modeled for everyone how to reach out to people, how to talk to people. And the disciples were many a time overawed by his responses, like the other people to whom he spoke. People were constantly found his teachings with much much authority and they were also found it very remarkable in fact one of the verbs that we find repeated in mark's gospel is they marveled at him they were amazed at him because of the words that he spoke okay people saw how jesus reached out now that is a huge lesson remember john's gospel chapter 4 the samaritan woman when jesus begins a conversation with her we are talking about sub, subverting our ideas of spiritual spirituality john's gospel chapter 4 when jesus begins his conversation with a woman a woman in that patriarchal society was looked down upon and then she was a samaritan not even a jew and thirdly she was an immoral woman but jesus was comfortable talking to her friends that subverting our ideas of spirituality if you thought jesus was a holy man why would he talk to somebody who is immoral maybe if she is a immoral woman he might have just walked the other way around isn't that the kind of spirituality we think of sometimes but you find that jesus talks to her what happens i'm not going into the whole story what happens she is surprised actually not surprised she is shocked you are a jew and you are talking to me she is shocked the disciples are returning back after getting some food they are also surprised they are wondering what is he talking to that woman but they did not ask him about it but imagine jesus was modeling for them how to talk to people evangelism and that woman became the first evangelist because she drew many people in her own village that day jesus's choice of people beats our understanding maybe you and i when you're looking around are only looking for people like us maybe people from our kind of a denomination maybe people uh, who who would uh, support the ministries that we would support okay we have those clicks don't we so we are looking at people within looking for people who we think are spiritual but god looks at people very differently even the way uh, david was chosen all of jesse's sons were called then samuel the prophet comes and they're showing up all the boys except the boy they thought was not fit for this but then samuel insisted do you have other sons why because god looks at the heart God looks at things differently. Okay, it's something very important as we learn lessons on spirituality. The Samaritan woman may not have had a chance if she only encountered 
I, I, I have to be careful what I say. Many an evangelist of our times, we could just bypass and move on. We don't take notice. We don't want to have a conversation. Jesus modeled evangelism. Jesus took rest. Disciples saw him that he was real. He was not some kind of like a angelic being who was just kind of floating about like a Superman. Well, Superman ideas of spirituality we have thanks to the influence of the media. But Jesus was tired. He slept. In fact, he slept on a boat when it was on the storm. He must have been really tired. He woke up early. He had a late night conversation with Nicodemus. He must have been a hardworking person. And the amount of distances that he walked must have made him tired. So people saw him for who he was, that he took rest. And they listened to all his teachings, washing their feet. The disciples would have had quite an impact with that experience. But the master sat down and said he was going to wash every one of their feet. Not just that. Loving his enemies, the way he reached out and spoke to people. For example, when he was arrested that night, and then Peter chops off somebody's ear and Jesus heals that man. Imagine that character, what would have happened to him? I'm sure he would have closely followed the crucifixion. And my guess is he might have become a follower of the Lord afterwards. I'm just imagining here, but I think there is some room for that imagination. Jesus was being kind to his enemies. Judas, the man who betrayed him, Jesus was being nice to him. He did not discriminate him. He wasn't being bad or mean to him. He respected the dignity of his choice. Or Pilate, the Roman governor who gave away that uh, 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 order for him to be crucified. The conversation that Jesus had with him. Right? So he had love for his enemies. On the cross, a fellow thief hurling insults at him, along with the people who put him on the cross, Jesus is not reacting. He's not angry. He's not saying, wait, you guys are going to get vengeance for what you're saying. That's maybe us. But rather Jesus focuses on this man who is now saying, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus gives him that amazing assurance that he will be with him in paradise that day. Sensitivity to that individual, that thief. Loving his enemies. Enduring suffering. Enduring suffering. Without a complaint. Hurling the insults, the physical pain, the excruciating pain on the cross, the emotional trauma, and the spiritual distancing from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit on the cross as he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The heart of the message of the gospel. Not even about Jesus' birth into this world. Yes, that's significant. But Jesus' death where he takes sin and its curse head on. God placed on him who knew no sin. He placed our sin on him. So he died. Isaiah 53, written about 700 years before the Messiah, talked about our sin being placed on him. By his stripes, we are healed. Well, Jesus modeled that for us. What an amazing reference. So much so in the Christian faith, when we think about Jesus or the symbol of Christianity, it is not the manger or a, or a crib. It's not even the boat from which Jesus preached. It, it's not uh, one of the priestly garments that he might have used, but it's really the cross. That symbol of shame, symbol of torture, that became a symbol for the whole church and Christianity. Why? Because Jesus faced death head on on our behalf. The spirituality of Jesus and what he modeled for us, not just what he taught, what he modeled for us makes us more responsible and calls us to follow our master. Uh, a few months ago, I wrote a uh, blog for the Times of India. I, I think uh, they didn't publish it, but it's published with RZM India blog. The last words of a dying man. The last words of a dying man, talking about Jesus' words from the cross. Well, quite, quite unexpected statements. If somebody had to make a prediction before Jesus said these words, what do you think somebody on the cross would say? I'm not sure how many words any follower of Christ would have got, got it right. 
right from the very first word to the thief and then to his mother and John, I am thirsty, it is finished. I once had an opportunity to speak at a, uh, to a group in an IIT partner. The topic was facing rejection in your life. We had people from other faiths there. In fact, it was organized by a wellness clinic. So it was not a Christian program. And uh, I talked about two historical examples of how people faced rejection. One was Steve Jobs. I picked up from his own uh, uh, commemoration address at Stanford University. And the second person was Jesus Christ. I talked about how Jesus Christ faced rejection from his own family, his friends, his followers, as he faced the cross. But the beauty is, when he hung on that cross, it was not the Roman centurion who put him on the cross who said, it is done, it is finished. It was not even Satan who uttered those words. It is finished. I got this guy on the cross. It was actually the victim who said, it is finished. In fact, he did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. The task is done. That people can now be redeemed, can be forgiven, can have a new life. What words from a man on a cross? Spirituality of Jesus is definitely out, out of this earth. It's something that you and I may not or would not be able to predict. Talking about uh, uh, Jesus enduring suffering and loving the neighbors, loving his enemies, even in that context. Some of you may have heard of this uh, story of the son of Hamas. It's a book published in 2010 by uh, Mossab Yusuf, who was a son of this, a founder, co-founder of the Hamas, the militant organization in Palestine. Now, this guy was uh, involved with uh, Israeli intelligence as a spy. And later on, he gets introduced to the New Testament and eventually became a Christian. So he wrote a book called Son of Hamas. But in that book, it's fascinating uh, what he has to say. Then I read this. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. These are his words. Okay, Born in a Muslim home, in a home that was part of the militant organization into fighting and terror. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. Matthew 5, 43 to 45. That's it. I was thunderstruck. He could not read beyond Matthew 5 because it's like really unsettling him because all his life he's been trained to kill, to kill the enemy. And for the first time in his life is reading a different kind of a spirituality which says, love your enemies. The beautiful thing is Jesus not just not only said that, he showed that on the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Oh my goodness. That's the spirituality of the Lord that you and I follow. Uh, a few, a couple of years ago, when Brother Ravi Zakaria spoke in Bangalore, I'm not sure if anybody's here from there who was part of the meeting. It happened in Christ University. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, another colleague of mine and I were joining Brother Ravi in the, uh, the Q&A. One of the questions that I responded to was this. Somebody said, all religions teach good things. Why do we have to present Christ? Now, well, it's a nice thought to have. Yes, religions do teach good things, but then religions are essentially different. So one religion actually says, kill the enemy, the unbeliever. Another religion says, love your enemy. It's different. One religion says, we are sinners, all have fallen short of God's glory. And another religion says, oh, we are all part of the divine. The divine is in you. Oh my, it's so different. That's why Brother Ravi Zacharias time and again used to say, religions are fundamentally different. So the spirituality of Jesus is something that you and I would be definitely surprised when we read this. Now, <clears throat> a well-known atheist or a new atheist by the name Sam Harris, interestingly, talks a lot about spirituality. He's against religion, 
but he talks about spirituality. He's a neuroscientist as well. So he says this, he wrote a book called uh, Waking Up, Searching for Spirituality Without Religion. Spir searching for Spirituality Without Religion. They are attempting some kind of a spirituality, maybe some Buddhist forms, maybe something to do with the psychology of a human being, but yet no God, nothing supernatural. It's all about us because they are, come from an atheistic perspective. Or we have uh, India's famous Sadhguru, who is known for his sessions and talks all over the social media, uh, Youth and Truth. He talks about inner engineering. What is inner engineering according, or according to him? Well, we are all part of the divine. It's all about getting a few practices, a processes in so that you can enjoy happiness and joy in your life. Against the idea that we are sinners in need of a God who is outside of us. Because they believe we are all part of the divine. Robert Coleman wrote this. Jesus did not ask anyone to do or be anything which first he had not demonstrated in his own life. Thereby not only proving its workability but also its relevance to his mission in life. So Jesus' modeling was so crucial to the message that he had to share. Friends, the greatest spiritual man who ever lived was God in human form, Jesus himself. He was the greatest spiritual man. I spoke in another campus uh, a few years ago uh, when, I, when the topic given to me was moving from the ordinary to the extraordinary. I gave this talk for them and then later after I finished the talk and my reflection about it, it dawned on me that the incarnation is a great example of the extraordinary moving into the ordinary world. Extraordinary moving into the ordinary world. That's Christian spirituality. For example, most quest, spiritual quest would be to move from the ordinary to the extraordinary. But biblically speaking, incarnation is about God stepping into the space-time universe and living like one of us. That's Christian spirituality. Jesus was born to Mary, the supernatural conception. But look at the timing of things, that Jesus as a baby from day one had a human father to take care of him. That shows us God upholds the human family. That's Christian spirituality. Look at the timing of it. Mary and Joseph are betrothed to be married, and then that's the time uh, the angel comes to Mary and kind of announces that she is the child. So it's so beautiful how God timed the whole thing, affirming human family. Secondly, friends, Christian spirituality, the greatest spiritual man who ever lived, he lived in his father's home for 30 years. And a th public ministry of just three and a half years. You know, honestly speaking, what I'm thinking is it should have been the other way around. Three and a half years in his father's home, and then he could have started young. After all, he's God in human form. He could have begun a ministry. Well, even if not in three and a half, maybe let's say at 10 or 11. What was he doing for 30 years in his father's home? Was Jesus any less spiritual? Actually, no. He was 100% God, 100% human being, right from the time he was conceived in Mary's home. God has a purpose in the 30 years of his life. Christian spirituality. He must have worked in his father's carpentry shop. Every Jewish boy at that time stayed home for so long. That was a culture. Jesus lived, grew up in that kind of culture. His conversations with people, we saw that in the previous session, didn't we? Conversations with various kinds of people. Zacchaeus, one whole evening to Zacchaeus. Not thinking about reaching out to more people, multitudes. He had time for the individuals. Jesus' movement. I am expecting the Messiah could very well have stayed in the synagogue or in the temple showing occasional public visits or maybe giving a discourse in the synagogue that people will go and listen. Jesus did that. His custom was to go to the synagogue. Luke's gospel says that. But we find Jesus did not stay in the synagogue. His spirituality pushed him to go to the dusty lanes of Palestine, or the seashore of Galilee. He was out there. That's the spirituality. So you see, this spirituality includes all of life. 
the material realities, relationships, conversations, buying, selling, all of that is encompassed in the kind of relationship. Jesus had a social dimension too. That's part of his spirituality. He went to at least one wedding in Cana of Galilee. He made many home visits. In fact, the Bible says he used to frequent the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He had a social life much before social media came into the scene. Jesus' spirituality is a spirituality that is modeled for you and I to follow. Let me try and be quick as I bring this to a close so we don't cut down on our Q&A. In the biblical understanding, the natural and the supernatural come together. Both are from God. Some people think it's only the supernatural. No, the natural world belongs to the Lord as well. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Incarnation of Jesus confirms the material world and all our vocations and relationships in it. The natural and the supernatural need to get along. Very beautifully, you find in Acts, Gospel, Acts uh, chapter 17, Paul's handkerchiefs was healing people, the supernatural side. But Paul got on and reasoned with people from the scriptures in the synagogues and out in the marketplace. Yeah, so there's a natural dimension at work. There's a supernatural dimension at work. The material and the spiritual come together. I'm sure Brother LT has done many sessions for us that way. How God looks to us in spite of the fact that we are sinners. God loved us while we are still unlovely. And then he converts us, transforms us into the image of his son. Let me uh, bring this to a close. Uh, so that, uh, yeah. But sometime, I mean, a couple of slides and then I'll be, I'll be through. This famous quotation, some of you would be familiar with this. Reynold Neighbor said this, talking about our expectations of spirituality. We want a God without wrath, who took man without sin, into a kingdom without justice, to the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Our expectations. We don't care about sin. We don't so much think about the holy anger or the righteousness of God. We won't even think about Christ not having to go through all the sufferings like Peter did. But spirituality, the Gospels offer, constantly challenge you and I. Jesus told us, Luke 9, 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him or her deny themselves, take up the cross daily and follow me. Very different from what you would normally expect. Christian spirituality is not fulfilling our will, but fulfilling the will of God through us. Finally, my last uh, reference to the scripture, and it's back to Mega. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, all inclusive. Didn't stop there, the social side. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these hang all the law and the prophets. That's how life works. Biblical spirituality or Jesus spirituality runs counter to what the world offers in the supermarket of spirituality. But it also constantly challenges you and I in our own anticipation, expectation about God. Maybe learn from the master. Learn from his word. Maybe learn in his presence. God bless us. Thank you for your listening. Over to Mega. <music>